today as we return to our seats and go into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word. We're going to be returning to our series that we've been doing over the course of this year over the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew's chapter 5 through 7. And in particular, we're going to be picking up where we left off before our family's trip and my doctoral seminars, um, which thank you for all of your prayers. They were wonderful and they still are going great. But we're going to be returning to chapter 6, in particular to the third section of teaching that Jesus gives us here in the Sermon of Sermons. In this section, we, as we've been discussing for several weeks now, we find where Jesus is teaching us how it is that we can truly live a real authentic faith. A faith without hypocrisy. In particular, asking and showing us that we need to check our motives behind what we say and do to ensure that we have the right motive and intention regarding how we practice our faith. And in particular, he's talking about three core practices of the faith that many would consider acts of righteousness, practices of giving to the needy, practices of prayer, and practices of fasting. And we got to go back to that very first verse of this section to really fully capture what it is that Jesus is getting at here, where he says... Beware of practicing your righteousness before others, other people, in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. In this, as we have discussed here, Jesus then addresses these three practices that had been abused by individuals so that they could get recognition. So that people would look at them and say, oh, look how holy and righteous that person is. You know, they would use these practices of giving these practices of prayer and practices of fasting as a means of getting the applause and accolades of man to make much ado about themselves when that's not why we have been giving these wonderful practices of faith that God calls us to practice because they're beneficial to our soul and beneficial to our relationship with him. And here Jesus makes it clear that those who have stretched and abused such things for their own personal gain has received their finite earthly reward and forfeited their infinite, eternal, heavenly reward. Jesus teaches us directly about how to and how not to. And we've discussed a little bit about the how not to, and we just began several weeks ago talking about how it is that Jesus actually invites us to pray. But before we can continue on, it's important for us to recap what we've already discussed by rereading how Jesus teaches us not to pray in Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. We must have this in mind today as we dive more deeply into where we went several weeks ago in verses 9 through 15, where Jesus begins to teach us how it is we ought to pray. And he teaches us a particular prayer that has been come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says this, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, and, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And as we discussed several weeks ago, this is a prayer that is a masterful, remarkable, and beautiful prayer. It is perfect in substance, structure, and content all at the same time. It covers everything and anything someone would ever want or need to pray as Jesus gives us six core petitions. 
in a perfect order. The first three dealing with the eternal, dealing with God, his holiness, and the coming of his kingdom. The next three being of this world, being of this nature and everything that we've, we face in this world and the challenges and the needs that we have. It is the perfect order. In fact, it's almost, you could say, as one commenter said, a replica of the Ten Commandments. The first three dealing with God and then the latter Seven, dealing with us. Putting God first and man second. Which is what Jesus teaches us to do here. Because it's so important for us to remember who God is. What God is capable of. How God has been throughout the ages. How he is faithful. He is true. He is honorable and just. We find here all that is ever needed for prayer. Prayers of adoration, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of submission and yielding, petition and confession, as we discussed several weeks ago. It's no wonder that this prayer has been seen throughout nearly 2,000 years as, as the prayer of prayers. It's been discussed in great length. Many inks and pages of paper, pens have been poured out discussing and talking about this prayer throughout our history from, from our great thinkers and minds like Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Tertullian, Cyril, Augustine, Aquinas, even Martin Luther, and many other great theologians in, of the faith have preached and wrote volumes just about this right here. And yet, as we discussed several weeks ago, we've just scratched its surface. This is a well that will never run dry. It's a well you never have to worry about having to dig deeper because it's constantly flourishing and bubbling up fresh, living water for us. More recently, it was the World War II theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer who would say this about this prayer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. The Lord's Prayer is not merely the pattern prayer. It is the way Christians must pray. The Lord's Prayer is the quintessence of prayer. It is the perfect prayer. It is indeed the perfect template for all who believe. Something we continue to write and discuss about today and will for all eternity, as once again we'll never fully plunge its depth. However, sadly, in our day and age, it often gets treated in improper ways manners and ways. It gets often misused for our own purposes and intents. And it also just gets prayed mindlessly. You know, where many of our brothers and sisters, you know, okay, it's time, we got to say that prayer again. You know, and we'll repeat the prayer, we'll repeat the prayer, we'll repeat the prayer. And it's just something, it's words that just mindlessly come off our mouth, which is completely against what Jesus just told us not to do. He told us not to do this. And what we need to realize is when Jesus is giving us this template of prayer. He is not being prescriptive. He's not saying, pray then like this, and now say these words exactly like this, uh, like I say them a hundred times, and then you've prayed. That's not what he's doing here. He's not providing us the prescription of the words. He is providing us the description of the content, the content of what we should bring to God in prayer. Jesus Although being literal here is not being literal. He's not being literal about the exact words, but he's being literal about what we should pray and how we ought to approach God in prayer. And he says, pray then like this. And he reminds us just in verses before, and when you pray, do not heap up those empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they, that they will be heard for their many words. You know, sometimes we can become all too familiar with things. I think about the beautiful Sierra Nevadas just right on the horizon out these doors. When I first came here, I was such a tourist. I mean, I always had my phone out trying to capture a picture of it as we drove home because we got to drive down 198 where Yokel broke off. And it was just such a wonderful time to get, got to try to get a picture, got to try to get a picture. Obviously not driving and trying to get a picture at the same time. 
I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> the point is, like, I just was always trying to take a picture of the mountains. I remember many times me and Jeanette trying to get that perfect picture from our back patio um, from the house we were renting at that time, just trying to get that perfect picture. Never could really quite capture its beauty in a photo, but we would keep trying. Every time we would go up and drive through the foothills near Three Rivers, oh my gosh, the beauty is just aston astonishing. I mean, even to this day, I find myself taking out a camera thinking, you know what, I'm going to get another picture. But what I find is the longer I'm here, the less astonished I am about it. The less awestruck I find whenever it's just that perfect day and the sun's coming over the peaks of the mountain, those snow-capped mountains. It's become familiar to me. I think about our family and friends when they come and visit us. They're just like we were when we first came. They're just trying to get pictures. You know, I often wonder what George and Rose thought when they picked us up at the airport when I candidated four years ago. Because I don't think I put my phone down for a second, just taking pictures of everything on the way to, from Fresno to here. It was just so beautiful and captivating. It made me contemplate God and his splendor. But the more I'm here, the less I find that I have that captivation if I don't force myself to stop. Sometimes I actually have to consciously remind myself, stop and look at the glory of God. Look at what his hand molded. Look at what his hand created. Sometimes we become all too familiar with something. And if we're not careful, the effect of that familiarity can also happen to us regarding the Lord's Prayer. Something we should never find ourselves too familiar with. Not because... Not because it's, it, of its words, but because of what it is that Jesus shows us here. The depth of which he shows us. The beauty of which he shows us that prayer can be in the life of someone who truly prays this prayer in a manner of knowing what it is they are actually praying. So important for us to pause and wonder. To stop. To take some time to remember what it is we are doing when we go to the Lord in prayer. Every time we pray, Jesus teaches us something here that should cause us to pause. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Let's just stop for a moment and contemplate that right now. Let's seriously take some time to ponder about what Jesus just instructed us to do regarding how we are to address God Almighty, the maker of the heavens and the earth, our Father in heaven. Have you ever thought about how radical that was? Radical of a thought, radical of something for someone to say, especially in the day and age of Jesus, that God should and would be personally addressed as Father by the disciples of Christ, by Jesus. To us, this seems normal. It's not uncommon for someone to say Father, Heavenly Father, or Father, 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 a dozen or two times in a 10-second prayer. It's not something that we normally think twice about doing. We just do it. It comes naturally to us. Sadly, Though often we never take a, a moment, just a moment, to realize what it is that we are doing. We are addressing God Almighty, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the creator of all things, the one who speaks light into existence. He makes light with a word. He creates with words. I mean, he brings creation out of nothing that God, the one true God, invites us to come to him as Father. I mean, can we feel the weight and the immensity of that? That God is our Father. It might come to us reflexively in our day and age, but in Jesus' day and age, this was not something the Jews would do. In fact, many of those on the mountain that side that day would have considered what Jesus was doing, that big H word we throw around a lot in the church today, called heresy. That that was heretical. It was blasphemy. No one in Jesus' time ever addressed God as Father. 
In fact, in the Old Testament, it's only used about a dozen times from Genesis to Malachi, the word father, in relation to God. And that relation is never personal. It's always referring to a people group or a nation. In particular, Israel. He is the father of the nation of Israel. No one would say, he is my father. That was something that would not come across a Jew's lips. And for his audience, this would have caused them to take a step back and go, whoa, our father. What are you talking about, Jesus? No one would have addressed it, the one true God, with such an intimate and personal relational way. This was unheard of. God was anything to the Jews but intimate, which was a fancy word that we would use, I mean, really close, nearby, with us. Instead, they would, they would emphasize his transcendence. They would emphasize the point that he was completely transcendent and completely far off away from them. That he wasn't someone you trifled with. God wasn't somebody you just walked up willy-nilly to and said, hey, what's up, Dad? In fact, there are only certain people who ever had that right to even approach the throne of God. And there was only one person in that certain group of people, the priest, who would have the ability to actually walk into his throne room, the Holy of Holies, one time a year to stand in the presence of God. Addressing God with such intimacy and intimate language was unheard of. One commentator sums it up best. No one had ever in the entirety of his, the history of Israel spoken and prayed like this. No one had ever prayed like Jesus. Not a one. What is fascinating is not only does Jesus pray and speak like this, he tells us to do the same. Because in him and through him, we have become children of God. When you pray and say, our Father, is that phrase just mere words? You feel you need to say because it's what you're supposed to say when you pray. Or are they the words you say because you have a deep sense and understanding of who God truly is in your life through Jesus Christ? And this is only one part of the radicalness of how Jesus invites us to approach God. How Jesus uses this word matters greatly. The word he uses here matters greatly, as there were various Greek words and Aramaic words that would express father. In particular, the word he uses is an Aramaic word called Abba. Now, there's been much debate on this word and its usage. Some say this refers to God in this very significant familial language like father, and that is it. Others would argue that the roots of this particular Aramaic word are not just father, but daddy. However, what you want to say doesn't really matter as much as you understand that no one addressed God in such an intimate way. And this was an intimate way of referring to God. This word Abba could mean something like daddy, but it was a word that only a child would use with their father. You, didn't, you wouldn't go to just random people and say, oh, he is my Abba. No, you have one Abba and one Abba only. And you honored and respected that Abba as your father. And only does that man get the same honor and respect that an Abba deserves from you. No other person would in all the earth. A good way of understanding this is beloved and dearest. My dearest father. My only father. My papa. There are no Greek or Aramaic word to express a deeper familial connection between a child and their father like this. Once again, this was revolutionary. Because not only was God inviting us to pray to God as our father, he was inviting us to pray to him as our authentic father, our dearest father, our most beloved father. Does it feel that way to you, though? When you pray, our Father, do you feel the significance of this in our lives? Or has it grown too familiar with us? That though we say, dearest, closest Father, we're not really even contemplating the significance of that. That it has just become something that we casually say, not taking a moment 
to really contemplate his real intimates with us, his closeness to us, the fact that God has literally bent near to hear us. From his heavenly throne, he has come down because through Jesus, we have been given the right of sonship and daughtership to be able to address God in such a real and intimate way, intimate way, And he invites us to call out to our Abba, our dearest Father. And this is something that Paul perfectly captures for us in Romans 8, 15 through 16. That we've been adopted by God. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And there's something significant about this even more, what Paul just said about how we've been adopted. Because adoption in this time period was a really big deal. To be adopted by someone, to be brought into their home, was to become one of their own. Was to take on a family name, a completely new identity as that person's child. You wouldn't be considered an adopted child. You'd be considered a child. And in this time period, what that would mean, because this was a big deal to add another mouth to feed in your family, they didn't have the resources like we have here in America. They didn't have the social programs like we have here in America. To do this was to make someone your own, to make them part of who you are. And to do that meant that they chose that person. And so when we understand that we've been adopted by God, you have been chosen by God to be a child of God. How awesome is that? Each and every one of you who professed Christ have been chosen by God. He said, I want you, Donna. I want you to be a part of my family. Can we feel the weight of that? The wonder of that? That God Almighty, the maker of heavens and the earth, the creator of the whole universe, wants us to be part of his family. Knowing that God is our Father, our dearest Father, that is a gift that has been freely given to us through Jesus Christ. If this is something you find lacking in your life, and you want and desire to know God as your dearest Father deeply, I encourage you to come and see me to talk more about this afterwards. One writer put it best. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls their worship and prayers and their whole outlook on life, it means that they do not understand Christianity very well at all. And isn't that the truth? Because in Christ, this is who God is. He is our Father. A truth we are to cultivate and grow in our lives for the sake of our very souls. Because as we cultivate and grow in our understanding of God being our Father, we we grow in our understanding of what God's really truly done for us. How he has provided us a redemption and forgiveness that we would have never gotten otherwise. How he has reconciled us in just the most wonderful of ways. Because we, as the Bible teaches us, were illegitimate sons and daughters before Jesus. Illegitimate. It says children of wrath. There's no way we could go to before God and say, Abba, Father, Father, Our Father who is in heaven. We couldn't do that, but because of Jesus, He has restored our relationship to Him again. Our understanding of this restored relationship, the very reality of this restored relationship, is directly connected with our understanding of who God is to us now. He is our Father, our dearest Father. I think about how young children are with their dearest earthly fathers. To many, their dads are invincible. They're the strongest men alive. You know, for me, my grandfather, there was nothing going to take him down. You know, you know, the playground jockeying. My dad can beat up your dad. You know, I, I, I always thought if my kids ever heard my kids in a conversation like that, I'd be like, I hope that their dad doesn't hear because I don't want anything to do with that. The point is... Much of us think highly of our fathers. And even for us who have 
at best, negative examples of fathers. Our fathers always falling short. Even the best of dads will fall short. Will always find that they don't quite measure up. God, our Heavenly Father, never falls short. He's always present and providing for us in powerful ways to make us confident in Him, secure in Him, and to bring about the wholeness of life that He intended for us. Whatever your earthly experience is with your dad, and no offense, I know we got some great dads here today, God's better. God's greater. And he always will be. Thanks be to God for this. For he is truly our dearest Heavenly Father. Now, Jesus isn't done with us, though. Because he doesn't just say, pray like this, our Father. He adds a little other thing to this particular petition of praise, or prayer, this first petition he makes. He says in that first half of verse 9, Our Father in heaven. We've discussed quite extensively how Jesus' prayer here already is revolutionary. It is radical to teach people to approach God in such a way. I mean, the Jews of his time would have been like, you can't talk about God like that. No one has ever talked about God like that. None of the kings, none of the prophets, no one. You can't do that. God is too holy. God is too transcendent. Jesus is showing how God has always been very intimate. But to help us to not be careful to fall into the pit the Jews were afraid of falling into, because you know how far the Jews would go to make sure that they would never even utter the name of God? They purposely misspelled it in the Old Testament. Their Bible, their scriptures, in all the manuscripts that they've made, they purposely misspelled the covenant name of God, which we believe through much scholarship is actually Yahweh. But they they never wanted to actually say the name. They never wanted to pronounce the name lest they take it in vain. So they would purposely misspell it. And that's why today we have names like Jehovah, which is actually the combination of two names that had been given to God through the ancient manuscripts to cover up what his real name was. The Jews were very concerned about just flippantly entering into the presence of God half-heartedly, half-mindedly. So Jesus here provides us the solution. He provides us the solution. Yes, go to him as your father. But remind yourself of which father he is. He is our father in heaven. He is above all. He is over all. He is sovereign of all. Yet he's still your father. He is very intimate, but don't forget his holiness. Don't forget his righteousness. Don't forget his transcendent nature. Even though he's right here with you, in you, moving through you through the power of his Holy Spirit, never forget who it is we are talking to. So often today, we lose sight of that transcendent nature of God. And sometimes we do flippantly enter his presence, over sentimentalizing his, his actual being, his holiness. In short, just like God is not some cosmic vending machine in the sky, we should never ever treat him like that in our prayers. We should also never treat him like our sugar daddy either. We need to be careful because we are approaching the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so Jesus shows us how it is we do this, how it is we balance these two realities about God. We approach him as our father, our most heavenly father, our loving, dearest father that is completely holy, completely other, above all things, higher than all things, as the great church father and son would say, the greatest thing that can ever be conceived, in particular, saying that if you think of something that's great, God's automatically greater. So every time we think of something great and greater, God will always trumpet. God will always be the greatest. He is our heavenly Father. Father stressing his intimates that he is involved in our lives and is intentionally made that so, so that we can call him Abba 
in heaven stresses God's transcendence, his sovereign nature, that he is reigning over us, that he surpasses all that is human. He is our father and our king. And we can affectionately call him Abba, dearest father. But we do it with a deep sense of wonder and reverence. This particular commentator that I've mentioned a few times goes on to say, he is our father, but he exceeds our earthly fathers in every way because he is our father in heaven. He always understands. He is always caring and loving. He never forgets us, and he always comes through for us. In conclusion, there's one last point we have to stress here in this very first petition. Our father in heaven. And that's the very first word that Jesus teaches us to utter. The word are. Which, one, is very interesting. It's a possessive pronoun, as if you possess something. And that's not what Jesus is getting at here, but also that it's a plural pronoun. He doesn't say, my father, my dearest father. No, he says, our father. And what he's pointing out here in this plural nature of this is that at all in the same time is that that we own God somehow, but we have been adopted by God, that we've inherited the right to call God our Father. Just like how our family today, when we go home, we say this is our home. Even though in that way we do, we possess, we own the home, our name is on the title. But the point here is that God is giving us a familial identity. We have become part of God's family. And so he's not just Pastor Brandon's father. He's Bob's father, Sonia's father. He's Lucas's father. He's Jerry's father. He is Sherry's father, Andrew's father. He's all of our fathers. And so as we go to him, we say, Our, our dearest father. There's no one like you. We are God's children. We are his family. We are sons and daughters of God. How beautifully perfect and fitting is that? Understanding that. Challenging us, though, is that how we approach our Father? Before we ever even utter a word, do we take the time to think, God's my Father. God's all of our fathers. He is our Father in heaven. Does the significance of what Jesus has done in our life strike us so fully that when we approach God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, as Abba, the dearest father, that that just sinks into us. One, elicits so much joy, but also just gives us so much awe, so much wonder. It's like, how could the God of all things consider me his child? Why would God choose me? I don't know. I don't know why he chose me but thanks to be to god that you did god if you want to judge how well a person understands christianity find out how much he makes of the thought of being god's child and having god as his father if this is not the thought that promotes and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life it means that he does not understand christianity very well at all How well do we understand God as our Father? This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. As our worship team comes forward today to lead us in a